In this video, we are going over small business financing news. Today is November 6th, 2024. My name is Jackson No with No Finance. Sorry, a fly just swatted me in the face. But we have some major news to report. Some I have some takes on everything that's happened with last night with the election. Donald Trump won. He defeated Kamala Harris. And the Republicans also have control of the Senate. We're waiting to hear back on the House. That is up for grabs. I've heard, uh, you know, I've heard leans both ways. So, uh, but if the Republicans have control of the, the House too, then they'll be able to enact all their policies that they want to do over the next couple of years until uh, the powers, if they shift, you know, obviously then they can't get as much done. But with that said, I think, uh, you know, we'll start there with, uh, with the news on, on the election. I would imagine that most of you are watching this is just a hunch. Maybe it's a personal opinion and you take that for what you will. But if you're a small business owner, a lot of the laws that were put into play, or the, especially the Trump tax acts back in 2017 were very beneficial to small business owners, especially the 20% the deduction is the, the major one, but also the, uh, originally it was a hundred percent inventory deduction right away where you could just write off a hundred percent, like any type of inventory that you're buying. Before the Trump Tax Act, you'd have to uh, amortize those uh, deductions or spread them out over a year, you know, four or five years. I'm not sure. I'm not a CPA. Okay. But uh, now you're with the Trump tax deductions, you're able to write off 100% year one. So all this could have gone away at the end of 2025 is when these Trump tax cuts were set to expire. So if Kamala won and the Dem Democrats had control, there was uh, you know, there's a likely chance that all of this would have went away and she would have been able to put in her policies, not to say that she wouldn't have had good policies for business owners, but when it comes to small business owners, with you know, you small business owners that this is your livelihood, you don't have a massive budget that you're operating off. Many of you only have cash reserves of one to five months. So for you all, I, in my opinion, I thought Trump was the, the better choice because it, it's likely that he's going to put all these all of these Trump tax acts permanent after 2025 when it was set to expire. So hopefully they even do it before then. We can get it get it done right away. But I mean, who likes paying more taxes? 20% right off the top. That's great. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're making, even if it's a hundred thousand dollars, instead of getting taxed at a hundred thousand, you're getting taxed at 80,000. It makes a huge difference. I mean, a couple thousand dollars and what you would have paid in taxes goes a long way for you small business owners, right? So. Anyway, I think that was a major win for small business owners was having Trump back in office, especially with the Republican control in the Senate. Um, I think the tariffs, while they did shake things up quite a bit when he was in office the first time, he, and he wants to double down on that. But I think the main thing too, is he wants to bring manufacturing back here. While that may not affect you small business owners directly, it's going to affect us indirectly. But it, if he... What he's proposing is a 15% tax on manufacturers. I'm sorry. It, instead of right now, it's 20%, which he lowered it on his first term down to 20%. Kamala wanted to raise it up to like 28, 29% on the corporate tax. If we lower it, if we give an incentive to businesses that manufacture here in the US, if we drop it down to 15%, it's going to incentivize them to start manufacturing here again. Instead of having their manufacturing done in Mexico, overseas and uh, a lot of businesses moved out of China and they're manufacturing part of the supply chain. But over in Asia, other countries that have cheap labor, if we can move all that back into the U.S., it's going to have a direct impact to the economy. I think it's going to be great for uh, workers here too as well. So my opinion, it may raise prices a little bit, but we'll see. Maybe it just has a balancing effect and then it has a positive impact on the economy because more people are working here. We have better jobs, manufacturing. But it's also, I mean, everything's going to feed in to that manufacturing done here in the U.S. So I think it's going to be a good thing. But we'll see how it goes. I, uh, again, you know, I, I would, the biggest thing for me was the 20% tax induction. I wanted to keep that in play because what I do, I'm not dealing with suppliers. I'm more of a, you know, we're just doing information here. I also broker, broker business loans. So for me, you know, all the, all the supplies coming in or have, having manufacturing done in the U.S., maybe it, it, probably not going to affect me as much or the tariffs, but it will affect you small business owners for sure. So we'll see how everything plays out. Yep. All right, moving on. So some of the other stories they want to hit on, SBA, again, 
is just getting railroaded by Republicans. They are not happy with the SBA. But I think the SBA is over their skis. I don't think it was all their fault. They were asked to do a lot since COVID. So I'm backing them up there. There's, uh, you know, the House Committee on Small Business was investigating into the SBA for 18 months on uh, how they were dealing with some of their collection issues with the, uh, with the pandemic loan. So we'll go over that. There's also uh, a story on a online sales platform that is now offering to their sellers emerging cash advances as well as line to credit and term loans. And they did a hundred million dollars this year. So that's exciting news. And then one last story that I want to go over is uh, there's a cannabis dispensary that was able to get a $30 million line of credit. And if you're, excuse me, if you're, if you're in that industry, if you're selling marijuana, if you're selling CBD, you know, you know how hard it is just with the red tape, just to be able to find a bank that wants to work with you, not even give you a loan, just for you to be able to use them as, as your, as your banking partner because of the federal re regulations, you know, it's still illegal. So even with the states, even if the state is legal, obviously it has to be legal for you to be able to do business there and what you're selling. But yeah, I mean, the, the banks don't want to touch a lot of the CBD and, and marijuana uh, dispensaries. So uh, it's, it's good news that they're getting these types of lines of credit now and term loans from larger uh, private equity companies, you know, banking is not banking institutions, but uh, you know what I mean? Private, private credit, not from, uh, not from banks. So that is good news on that front, but let's go ahead let's go back to, I'm going to go to the story about the house committee investigating the SBA. So this was about the SBA decided to end collections on the EIDL loan. So if you remember the EIDL economic injury disaster loan during COVID, during the pandemic, you could get, it was up to, originally it was up to 150,000, then it went to 500, then it went to 2 million. So at the end of it, you could get up to $2 million. And it was all based on what you showed on your tax return as far as gross revenue. It was gross revenue, I believe it was for uh, year of 20, 2019. So you, the uh, EIDL, I think it stopped around 2022 is when they stopped giving out these loans. But uh, whatever you showed gross, not even net, so gross revenue. So if you showed gross sales of $50,000, you could get a up to $100,000 EIDL loan. So if you know, if you're a small business owner, and you're doing $50,000 in gross revenue. I mean, that's a very small business. It, that might even be like your, your second job really is like, you're just doing some consulting work or you're just doing like a project on the side. So for, for these types of companies to get a hundred thousand dollar EIDL loan over 30 years, a lot of those companies go out of business or they just stop because especially during pandemic, it was really hard for them to get business and uh, they weren't able to make their payments, even if they were so little. I mean, it, imagine a hundred thousand dollars over 30 years. I don't know what the payment was on that, but it was 3.75% interest. So it was just, I mean, it had to have been like a hundred, 200 bucks. But uh, they weren't able to make these payments and the SBA just decided to stop collections. And I think why they did it is because it, it didn't make sense, you know, as far as the budget goes, like for them to go after these small businesses and these owners didn't have any collateral. I believe you didn't have to put up any collateral. I'll have to go back and check this, but uh, let me know in the comment section if you all remember, but I believe it was anything under $500,000, you did not have to put up collateral for, for an EIDL loan. So there's nothing for them to go off after except, you know, maybe send them something in the mail or give them a call and say, Hey, you know, you're, you're behind on your, your SBA loan for, from the pandemic. Like we need, you need to pay this or else, but really they had nothing to go after. I mean, if they shut down the business, we're, they're not going to keep making payments on that. So anyway, I think my opinion, this whole, the, the EIDL loans, the PPPs, obviously there was fraud involved too, but they, uh, you know, they did this in an effort to keep small businesses open, but at the same time, I mean, well, first off, they should have shut down the country and that's, you know, that's many people's opinions. And I think that's why Trump got elected is because all this went on and everything was shut down for so long, but I digress. So anyway, they, they just gave out way too much money. That was it. At the end of the day, most businesses didn't need this money. They, a lot of, a lot of companies or a lot of small business owners, I mean, there was more boats sold, more RVs sold than ever, more cars. I mean, everything went great in 21 and 22, because if your business stayed open, you actually 
you did better than, than you ever did before. I mean, I heard so many businesses were actually doing better during the pandemic because so many people were staying home, they were spending less money or they were at home and they're like, you know what, I'm here all the time. Let's make a renovation on the house or like, Hey, let's, uh, you know, now I work, can work from home. Let's buy an RV and travel the country. And, uh, you know, we'll just, I'll work from my computer. We'll get, we'll get Wi-Fi. We'll put a satellite on the RV and I can be in the mountains in some national park and also do my work during the day, work two hours and I'll be done. You know, so it was that, that kind of life, which I don't blame people, but at the end of the day, they gave out way too much money. That's what caused the inflation. I'm not saying this was actually Biden Harris. Trump did this as well. He was the one that put the SBA PPP loan, PPP, ERC, EIDL into play. But, you know, obviously Biden Harris and the, uh, the whole government decided to keep giving more money into this. I'm not saying it's one side or the other. I think it was more, I think it was the whole, you know, the whole system in play here, but they just kept putting money into these small businesses. And eventually a lot of these companies, a quarter of them couldn't pay these loans off. So it was a huge deal. But anyway, what the SBA decided to do, they're not in the collections business. So they pass this off to the treasury, but it took them 18 months to say, Hey, you know, we're going to reverse our decision after all this scrutiny, you know, we, uh, we agree. We'll, we should definitely collect on these loans and then they pass it off. So again, my take on it, the SBA. <clears throat> while they do, you know, they, they, uh, obviously they'll do uh, SBA loans for disasters, not just like your SBA 7A working capital loan that you can get through a bank. But, you know, anytime there's, especially like with the hurricanes recently, which is a whole nother story because they ran out of money, but I don't think that's the SBA's fault again. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, they're, they were put into play. So like when the pandemic happened, you know, they've already taken care of small businesses for decades when disasters happen. So when a, when a pandemic happens and businesses are forced to shut down, it did make sense that they put this into play. I just think too much money was given out at the end of the day. And that's why they're in this situation now. And then we had, uh, we covered a story last week where they had a, the $100 million 3 navigator pilot program that had a lot of screening over that. They only started 500 companies. So I think they just had way too much on their plate over the last four years and they need to they just need to hone in and like there, there needs to be a consensus on what the SBA is meant to do. And if they need to start, I don't want to saying to start another agency. I, I like how the government is trying to put money into these small businesses. There just needs to be more oversight into how, like, w you know, what's the goal of this program? Obviously with the pandemic, we just said, Hey, let's get out money. We need to keep these businesses open. We need to do this as quickly as possible. So there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, there wasn't necessarily like a goal or a target to but with the community navigator pilot program, a hundred million dollars is sent out to CDFIs and in, you know, community, other community, like financial resource type centers in these cities that were, you know, they're designed to help support entrepreneurs and small businesses, you know, for them to not have a target to say, let's start this many companies this year this many, I'm sorry, this many small businesses and let's give out the, you know, this many counseling hours so we, they can receive further financing or, you know, as far as like financial help, like how to run their business, how to keep, you know, profitable. There's just no oversight in that. So, you know, I, I just, they need to rethink how they're going to implement these dollars, these tax dollars that are going to these small businesses. So that's my take. I think a lot of this was done and, you know, it, it's a good idea. We just need to fine tune these processes and operations. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're not creating more inflation by just sending dollars out. You know, we got to make sure that there is a return on the investment for the American taxpayer. All right. That's my two cents. Moving on, moving on. Okay. So uh, back to the platform that, uh, that you probably use since, like I said, 2004, so the, it was the, probably the first player in the space. But eBay is the company that has done over $100 million in funding year to date. 40 million of that is merchant cash advances. So again, that's unsecured financing for small businesses. And the way that it, they call this embedded financing. So like eBay, other e-commerce platforms, Amazon, Shopify, even Walmart now, a DoorDash, they just to name a few different ones, but they're now using what they call embedded financing. So. It's, it's basically just a fancy way of saying you're a seller on the platform, or if you're DoorDash, like you're a DoorDash or you're, you're delivering 
food to people or, or whatever items to people, but you're, you're essentially a, a worker, you're a cog in the system, you're, you're selling something, you're providing a service to these large platforms and they're saying, Hey, we'll actually, we'll lend you money and you, uh, will retain a percentage of the gross sales every single day, or every time you bring in $1, we keep X percentage of that dollar based on the agreement that we set. All right. So Liberus is a UK based company that expanded in the U S four years ago. They are the ones that partner with eBay, their emerging cash advance lender. And they'll do, if you have sales with eBay for the last three months, here are the qualifications here, right? So sales history with eBay for the last three months, when one transaction, only one transaction for the last three months, um, at least $5,000 total with eBay in the last 12 months, and they'll do funding up to a million dollars. And then the payback is what I saw on, on, on the website. Payback is based on 20% of gross sales. So I believe for every dollar that you generate, they're going to hold back 20% until they receive the principal and interest that you agreed upon at the beginning of the loan. Okay. Other partner that eBay uses is Funding Circle. And if you follow me, you've heard me before. I'm not the biggest fan of Funding Circle. They're also UK based. They do up to $500,000. You must do 50,000 annually up to 84 month term. And they, they have monthly fixed payments. Funding circle. Anytime I would, I, I don't think maybe we funded one deal with funding circle. And with my time, when I was managing a merchant cash advance firm, it was a brokerage. We, you know, we funded over 2000 clients, $200 million. I think maybe one of those deals was funding circle. Funding circle to me, it's very hard to qualify. And I think most of their deals, like you have to have excellent credit. You have to have excellent business history, a lot of cash flow. I mean, I just, maybe, maybe it was just because it was a bad year for funding circle. Like they weren't, they weren't funding as many deals. They want to be tighter with their criteria, with their lending criteria. Um, I'm not really sure, but I was never a fan of funding circle. I feel like every time we'd send in their information, it would get sold to other lenders, you know, to other merchant cash advance lenders. And that's what, you know, a lot of you guys, if you're filling out this information, you got to be careful because you don't know who it's going to get sold to just because they say they're not, they, that you sign it. Like when, when you fill out the application at the end, it says a lot of times at the end, you know, it says that they can use this for marketing purposes and it's loosely based on them just being able to sell your information. So. A lot of these companies will spend a lot of ad dollars and for them to be able to be profitable or operate, you know, at a, be, just be able to operate, to be able to do these ads and, and get more customers, they end up selling their information for the deals that they can't do themselves. So there's just this whole network. I mean, there's hundreds of lenders out there that do purchasing cash advance and they're buying these leads. And a lot of times if your, if your information gets sold, it gets sold to like 10 different broker shops or lenders and you're getting it blown up. So again. That's why I don't like funding circle. That was my experience. Maybe it's been done different for you. If you all have been funded directly from funding circle, would love for you all to reach out and let us know. Or if you had a bad experience either way, I'm just always trying to get feedback so I can let you small business owners know, you know, what, what the experiences are out there, how, how people feel about a certain lender or broker shop. So that's, but yeah, that's it on that. So anyway, it's good. If, if you use eBay, if you're a seller on eBay. I would love to hear your all's feedback too on Liberus if you use them for a merchant cash advance and see, uh, I would love to hear what the interest rate was that you agree upon and if they are holding 20% of the gross sales or if it's more or less. So please let us know. The last, <clears throat> the last note, financing deal of the day, Deep Roots Harvest. They are a cannabis dispensary that has several locations there in Nevada. They received a $30 million line of credit from the Chicago Atlantic Group. The Chicago Atlantic Group has funded 100 plus deals worth over $2.2 billion since 2019. So the, again, this is huge news because I don't see a lot of these deals out there. I'm constantly checking. I'm, I'm checking different websites that, that cover these larger deals for small businesses. And cannabis is just, it's really hard to find cannabis lenders. You know, I see some merchant cash advance lenders that want to do cannabis deals, but not these larger, uh, private credit companies like, like Chicago, uh, Atlantic group. So for them to be able to get a $30 million line of credit is huge for the cannabis industry. So if you're in the cannabis industry, I, I'd suggest you to reach out to Chicago Atlantic group or try to find another lender and let me know if you find somebody else 
but that is, uh, again, big news coming from that industry. There's so much red tape. So for them to be able to find private credit is a very big deal. So that's it on the news today. Thanks for stopping in. We'll be back tomorrow with more news. I do this every single day. If you like the video, please, please like it, subscribe for more updates. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, trying everything, but I love YouTube. This is where I'm typically at, but I hope you all have a great rest of the day and we'll see you tomorrow.